Hello everyone, I'm Gary Hogan and welcome to Refinery Life Australia. I'm the senior pastor and lead elder of Refinery Life Church on the beautiful Gold Coast. If you're on the Gold Coast anytime, feel free to come and join us as we meet together and we share in the word of our Lord. We meet at 9.30 on Sundays at 222 Turpin Road, Labrador. For more details, you can visit our website, which is www.refinerylife.org. We hope you really enjoy this message and that you get a touch from God today. Now, one of the greatest tragedies of life is the inability or the neglect of a father to pass on to his children the benefits of his experience. Fathers must instruct, they must warn, and they must encourage their children. And for the next little while on Wednesday evenings, our messages will be from John's first epistle and are titled, The Counsel of a Spiritual Father to His Children. And today we're discussing the tests of fellowship. The text we're going to concentrate on is 1 John 2, 3, and it says, And this is how we know daily by experience that we have come to know him to understand him and to be more deeply acquainted with him. If we habitually keep focused on his precepts and obey his commandments and teachings. And 1 John 2, 9, we'll we'll look at as well. And it says, the one who says he is in the light, in consistent fellowship with Christ, and yet habitually hates works against his brother in Christ, is in the darkness until now. The scripture reading we'll work through is 1 John 2, 3 to 14. Let's read it together. It says, And this is how we know daily that we have come to know him and understand him and to be deeply acquainted with him, if we habitually keep focused on his precepts and obey his commandments. Whoever says, I have come to know him, but does not habitually keep his commandments and teachings, is a liar. And the truth of the divine word is not in him. But whoever habitually keeps his word and obeys his precepts and treasures his message in its entirety, in him the love of God has truly been perfected and is completed and reached maturity. By this we know for certain that we are in him. Verse 6, whoever says he is in Christ, that is, whoever says he has accepted him as God and Saviour, ought as a moral obligation to walk and conduct himself just as he walked and conducted himself. We're called to walk like Christ and conduct ourselves like Christ. Verse 7, Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the message which you have heard before from us. Verse 8, On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you which is true and realized in Christ and in you. Because the darkness of moral blindness is clearing away and the true light, the revelation of God in Christ, is already shining. The one who says he is in the light in consistent fellowship with Christ and yet habitually hates works against his brother in Christ is the darkness until now. The one who loves and unselfishly seeks the best for his believing brother lives in the light, and in him there is no occasion for stumbling or offence. He does not hurt the cause of Christ or lead others to sin. But the one who habitually hates his brother is in spiritual darkness and is walking in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I'm writing to you, little children, because of your sins have forgiven, sorry, your sins have been forgiven in his namesake. You have already been pardoned and released from spiritual debt through his name because you have confessed his name, believing in him as Saviour. Verse 13, I'm writing to you, fathers, those who believe, those believers who are spiritually mature. That's what we're talking about when he says fathers, because you know him who has existed from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have been victorious and have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you have come to know the Father. Verse 14, I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has existed from the beginning. Let's read it again. Young men, because you are strong and vigorous, and the word of God remains always in you. 
And you have been victorious over the evil one by accepting Jesus as Saviour. I think we all want to fall into one of those groups. As a preface to his instructions concerning the irrefutable proof of one's abiding fellowship with God in Christ, John exhorted believers to avoid sin and be conscious of Satan's ever-present efforts to tempt and seduce the children of God. But realising that the sinful nature is still present with us, even though our souls are redeemed, John reminded readers that all is not lost when we sin. God has made provision through the advocacy of Jesus, our great high priest, who is seated at the right hand of God in heaven. With that incomparable truth established, John proceeded to set forth two tests that will prove that a person has fellowship with God. The first test is that of obeying God's commands in 1 John 2.3. No is a very special word. It is more than just being acquainted with someone. It describes a continuing relationship that has deepened and become more intimate because of shared experiences. I could illustrate that like this. Imagine there's an individual that we've both met and at the same time on the same day. We made his acquaintance, we learned his name, and maybe we discovered something about him. Our relationship was established. But then I went away and I I never saw that person again. But on the other hand, you cultivated the relationship. You saw the person almost every day. You become friends and you shared experiences together. Both of us know the person, but my knowledge of him is only in passing. You really know him because you've experienced life situations together. This is the knowledge of God to which John was referring to. How can we be sure that we know Christ? By a natural desire to keep his commands, that's how. John was not indicating a dutiful act of obedience, as a slave obeys his master with no feeling. Instead, he was advocating obedience based on who Jesus is, and who he has become to us. John was talking about constantly keeping or guarding God's word, and this requires daily meditation on scripture. In verse 5, John said that whenever someone takes God's message to heart, the love of God has reached its full stature in that person. Jesus said in John fourteen fifteen, If you really love me, you will keep and obey my commandments. Love, in its very essence, is a reciprocal experience. The perfect ideal of love involves two parties. We must express love to one another, and that person must in turn respond with love. This is what John meant when he said that we are to obey God's word. We are responding to the love that caused God to reach out to us in the first place. And the second test is that of loving one another. It's 1 John 2.9. We must clearly understand the kind of love which John was referring to. He was not talking about the affection we have for those we like and the things that we have in common. Loving those who are lovable requires no effort. John was talking about the type of love expressed by the word agape, which is a self-sacrificing love that does not consider First, whether that person will return the love to us. Its interest is entirely for the well-being of the person who the love is being expressed. So how do we love others that are unlovable or those who are hostile or insulting or offensive? It happens naturally. It happens spontaneously because it comes out of the overflow of love produced in our hearts because of our obedience to God's word. If we obey God's word, we will fill us to overflowing with his love. And it will, sorry, and it is that love that we will automatically love each other and others and the unlovable. And John added, almost as an afterthought, that when a Christian loves others, he has no occasion of stumbling in him. 1 John 2.10 The one who loves unselfishly seeks the best for his believing brother, lives in the light, and in him there is no occasion for stumbling or offence. How good is that? Are, Are you producing the love of Christ? So in other words, 
When we show love to others, no stumbling blocks are in our way to keep us from growing in grace, from advancing from glory to glory in our Christian lives. That's the type of love I want to be able to show. It's not easy. Now, two things are inseparably, inseparably related, and they assure us of continued fellowship with God. First, a natural, habitual obedience to God through the keeping of his commands. That's the hard part for most of us in the Western world. And second, a habitual loving of others, which becomes a natural overflow of our obedience to God. That's the challenge for you this week. Can you be obedient to God and do, can you show that natural overflow of love because you're being obedient to God? Now, I really want to encourage you as well to be diligent with your Bible study time. It's so important because God has so much more for us than we can get from just going to church once or twice a week or hearing someone else talk about the Word. And when you spend time with God, your life will change in amazing ways because God is a Redeemer. There's nothing that's too hard for him, and he can make you whole, spirit, soul, and body. And you're important to God. You know that already. But you're also important to us at the refinery. So when it comes to prayer, we believe that God wants to meet your needs and reveal his promises to you. Don't wait for a prophet to come along and say, I've got a word for you. He'll reveal his promises to you directly. So whatever you're concerned about, whatever you need prayer for, we want to be here for you. Even if you just want to say hi, you can contact us on www.refinerylife.org or via any of our social media channels. Until next time, stay in the blessings. Mm-hmm.